Hey everybody, how's it going? This is Seth Williams from the RE Tipster podcast and I'm here with my co-host Jaron Barnes. And Jaron and I are really fortunate. We had a chance to, or we're having a chance to sit down and talk with Scott Myers. And Scott is somebody that I've, I've heard about for a long time. And he's sort of a, a leading expert in the world of uh, investing in self-storage units. And this is something I've just had a ton of interest in for a lot of years. Uh, back when I used to work as a commercial banker, I used to look at a lot of self-storage deals and just think like, man, it would be so cool to like get into one of these deals as an investor. Um, there's a lot of stuff I, I learned through that process, but a lot of unanswered questions too. So um, I'm pretty excited just to talk to Scott and get his insights on how the business works. So Scott is based in Indianapolis, Indiana, and he's worked on a lot of super successful storage unit deals. Um, and uh, along the way, he's, uh, he's done a few, I think, I guess we'll probably hear more about it, that almost cost him everything, apparently. So in today's show, we're going to dive deep into all things self-storage, the good, the bad, the dangerous, and the ugly. With that, Scott, welcome to the show. How you doing, man? Hey, fantastic. Thanks, Seth, for having me. It's good to chat with you and Jaron. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I'm really pumped because as I've mentioned here on the podcast before, like I actually have a personal goal within the next six months to a year to get my first storage unit deal under my belt. So nice, I am going to be picking your brain uh, <laughs> quite extensively during during the show today. You know, I thought Perfect. it was crazy that you're from Indianapolis, man, because like I've been connected with the local Syria there and like heavily involved mm -hmm. in the investor world for like the last almost the last three years until I moved here in March. And mm -hmm. I didn't hear about you until I moved to Chicago. It was like super weird. Uh, you know how that works, Jaren. You uh, you can't be a prophet in your own town. And so you don't hear about something or somebody until after you move away. At least uh, that's the way I see it. Yeah, man, for sure. So, well, to kick this thing off the ground, mm -hmm. tell us a little bit about your background. You know, uh, take us back to, um, you know, when I was just two years old, back in uh, the year of 1993, when you got started in real estate. Yeah, sure. So in 93, yeah, I was uh, working for a Fortune 500 company and uh, decided I wanted to have something to hedge against just a standard 401k for my retirement. I didn't want to bet on that big casino on Wall Street to take care of my retirement. And so I uh, started looking into many other investment books on how to invest and uh, other alternative investments and then I uh, got into real estate. And so, uh, yeah, that's when I got plugged in, started buying it, everything I could get my hands on in books about investing in, uh, in real estate. And then uh, two years after that, joined the local RIA, uh, Central Indiana Real Estate Investors Association, and began listening to a lot of the gurus coming through and started investing in uh, single family houses. And so uh, buying them to uh, following the Carlton Sheets method and uh, the Ron Legrands of the world and uh, buying them to, to rent, um, putting a, a fair amount of work into them, refinancing, pulling cash out, and then buying more of them. The idea was to grow a rental portfolio. And uh, that was going well until it didn't go well. And uh, didn't want to get out of real estate. I still liked the idea and I thought there was money that could be made in this if they just had to, you know, I, I just need to ramp things up and get some economies of scale. And so I started buying apartment complexes um, as well. And so we had a whole bunch of houses and a whole bunch of apartments. And then um, the recession of 99 hit. And uh, what that did is it uh, put a pinch on, on everybody. But uh, at that time, we had uh, a lot of rentals. You know, we had about 500 units. And um, the Community Reinvestment Act um, was put out into the marketplace uh, where, um, as we all know, uh, which was uh, the cause of the Great Recession. You know, anybody that could fog a mirror could get a loan. And so all our tenants were leaving to get houses and uh, because they could and who, you know, who could blame them. And so we were trying to um, turn that ship around. And that's when we almost lost it all. I mean, for three years, we struggled to turn that ship around and um, finally get ourselves out of that, sold off all our houses and, uh, and uh, virtually all of our apartment complexes. We had one left. And then that's when I started looking into self-storage. And I thought, I don't, you know, I don't want to be susceptible to tenants and toilets and trash and, and how houses and apartments, you know, take a, a, a dive during every recession. They just, you know, the values go up and down. And it's just this crazy cycle. So, how, you know, what can I invest in in real estate that doesn't have tenants, toilets and trash and, and isn't affected by a recession? And so well, that leaves parking lots. Uh, but you can't create a lot of value in those and self-storage. And because when tenants don't pay you, you lock them out and you sell their stuff. And during a recession, 
um, the, there is an increase in demand for storage because people are downsizing and businesses are downsizing. So d during a good economy, um, things are chugging along um, up and to the right. And then during a recession, the whole self-storage industry takes a spike because there's lack of development because the banks tighten up and there's an increase in demand. So it's that inflation-proof, recession-proof sector. So the more I got uh, looking into it, I realized that, yeah, this is, if I'm going to stay in real estate, weather the storm and um, you know, not only uh, lose a business, but have one that thrives during you know, every economic cycle, I better learn about this. And so I did. And so I started learning about it, investing in it. And uh, lo and behold, I mean, I don't know how far you want to go with this. Uh, we've, we have grown our education business and our investment business and blended the two together. And that's, um, that's where we find ourselves now, where I am. Um, um, we have an education business that was doing very, very well for a while. And I, I had to really kind of put a line and draw a line in the sand um, and say, hey, I'm, I'm either going to spend a lot of time teaching people how to do it or I'm going to do deals and make more money. And so we, we, we kind of uh, backed away from the, uh, the education side of the business, but um, still kept it open, but only working with people that we know are going to go out and do it and that we could potentially partner with. And so now uh, we have some high, uh, high level uh, mentoring programs and masterminds where we're just working with A players, but we can go out and partner with deals and um, tap into private equity. And so that's where we find ourselves uh, today is um, uh, doing deals all over the country with our, our partners and um, developing projects uh, here in Indianapolis as well as all throughout the country and um, in a pretty good spot right now. It's been a, it's been a good ride. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. Thanks so much for sh for sharing that. I so I have I actually have the privilege of moonlighting Scott's course on on storage units. So in the next couple of weeks, as I go through that, I'm going to be doing a completely honest, non biased review of kind of my thoughts of what everything he went through, and I'm going to be using the material that I I find in there to actually go and get a storage unit. So I'll be tracking, you know, um, you know, very much case in point. I'm going to get in the trenches and go get one and bring you guys along with me. So just definitely check out the blog. There'll be a link in the, the show notes eventually. Once I actually have the review out, we'll backlog and I'll put a link to my review in the show notes. And that'll be at uh, www.retipster.com forward slash two eight. Um, I'm looking forward to that, Jaren. I, I'm, yeah, I'd love to get your thoughts on how that, how that works and what you're able to learn from it. So, well, Scott, I'm, I'm just curious, there's sort of like, there's a lot of fundamental questions that immediately come to mind when I think about the self-storage business. Mm -hmm. And one of those questions is, like in your experience personally, have you gone after like facilities that already exist and were, were sort of dilapidated and then you bought them and turned them around or have you been like building them from the ground up, like buying land and just building them from scratch? Mm -hmm. Yeah, a little bit of both. And that, um, you know, in the, in the beginning, of course, the quickest way to get into any business is to, to obviously buy one that's already, uh, you know, up and going and cash flowing. And that's obviously the safest way as well, um, because you've got a historical track record of, you know, performance that the bankers can track and they can say, okay, well, um, if we're going to buy this uh, facility um, and we're going to loan you the money so that you can buy this facility, we can look back on the past 12, 24, 36, 48 months and, and, and see, you know, and predict now, see where it went and now predict where it's going to head from there. Uh, so that's, um, from that standpoint, that's where we had to start because we couldn't walk into a bank and say, hey, I'm going to develop a facility with zero experience. Yeah. Uh, but also, uh, I'm a value-add guy. You know, I started out with uh, houses and apartments and, and you know, always buying something that's distressed, turning it around, putting money into it, creating value that way. Um, apartments are income producing, so you raise the income and lower the expenses, and, and that's how you create value in, in apartments because it's an income stream versus just the real estate. Well, self storage is the same thing. It's you know it's, it's real estate, so you can improve it to make it look better, um, but it's all a function of you know bringing in more income, reducing the expenses. It's all about the net operating income, and and making those changes and, and that effect. So buying those existing distressed from the mom and pop owners who, you know, didn't add any technology from even a website to you know a kiosk. We can run our facilities with a with a kiosk. Um, you know, putting in standardized collection procedures, you know, just you taking, taking advantage of the technology that's out there today and running it better and, and, and marketing for crying out loud. They weren't doing even any marketing. Mm -hmm. um, or I, I love it when I go to a facility, it, it may not even be distressed, but we go to a facility and these owners say, uh, well, you know, we've been, we've been full for five years now or hundred percent full. We have been for five years. And they, I know exactly what that means. It means they haven't raised rates in 10. <laughs> so we can go and increase the value that way. So that's that's how we started, you know, first several years. But then, um, yeah, we we lined our pockets and and got a, a kitty to go out and then develop because that's I mean that's how you truly 
add value in real estate is you, you buy a piece of dirt and then you put an income stream on it. Or you buy an old Kmart or an old bowling alley and you convert it and put an income stream on it. Um, you know, that's when you really create value in, in real estate. And so uh, doing a healthy mixture of both right now, we're doing a, a lot of development because um, through the Great Recession, uh, there's, there was a, a, a huge demand for storage, but the development dollars by the banks weren't out there. And so we're still in catch up mode. And so for the past several years, we've been um, embarking on a lot of development projects and launching more all the time. So it's a, I think it's a healthy mix for, for the folks that are listening you know, and looking at getting into this for the first time, you know, clearly an existing facility, a turnaround project. Um, you know, the class C facilities you take up to a class B, um, there's always a market for that. And uh, as long as you're hitting your marks and, and doing your homework right on the front end, um, you, you should be in good shape. Yeah. I wonder if, uh, <laughs> like, say if you're looking at, at an existing facility and <laughs> looking at ways that you can improve it and, you know, make the, the income higher and lower the expenses. I heard you say things like technology, mm -hmm. uh, you know, advertising, things like that. Mm -hmm. But I wonder, like, does it ever happen where, like, the reason the facility is doing so poorly is because it just never should have been built in the first place? Like, mm. there just isn't a market for it. Does that ever happen? Or mm. is there always something that can be done to make it better? Well, never say never, never say always. Um, <laughs> but it, it's pretty rare that we'll find a facility that um, is not, it's underperforming, and it's purely because they never should have built it in, in the first place. Mm -hmm. um, first of all, any facility that's going to be developed today, I mean, it's a little more serious business, you know, back in the old day, um, you know, in the early stages of self-storage in the 70s um, and early 80s when there was a big self-storage boom. Um, yeah, the, the, the mantra you hear in our industry is build it and they will come. And that, that, and that was the case. Um, you could plunk one of these things down in the middle of a farm field as long as it was a small one, small enough one that, you know, w would feed that community, if you will, the demand there, then it would be fine. Uh, but as self storage is coming to Main Street now, uh, most developers are, are are building, you know, multi-story temperature control. They're not out in the middle of a farm field or in an industrial part of town because that's where the zoning is. Um, now it's more of a retail store in a location and has that type of zoning. And so um, you'll see them. <laughs> uh, my my developer buddy says who lives down in the South, he says, I wouldn't develop a facility unless I can see Walmart and smell McDonald's. <laughs> and those are, the, those are the sites that we're seeing, you know, the intersections and the places where we're seeing facilities being built. But so they're becoming uh, a little more expensive, but it's a more expensive asset. And so for that reason, developers aren't going to spend, you know, millions of dollars to develop this thing, you know, in hopes that they will come anymore. So uh, long would an answer to your question, Seth, but, you know, there's, there's a set of numbers that we can hang our hat on for the most part. And that is when, you know, our market for a storage facility, if we're going to buy an existing one or develop one, I'm going to draw a three mile ring around that site, that existing facility or this piece of ground that I want to buy and develop. And I'm going to look at the existing self-storage facilities that are there. And I, you know, we have ways to get the, the square footage of all those. We want to know what the square footage is. And then we compare that to the population. And, you know, the magic number, if you want to call it that, is somewhere between six and a half to seven square feet of self-storage per person in that three mile radius is considered equilibrium or thereabouts. If there's 10, 11, 12 square feet per person, and eh, maybe getting towards uh, oversupplied, and and you know they're they are compressing their prices a little bit, and they may not have um, high occupancy. We're in that um, five, four, three and a half square foot per person. You know, th there's some unmet demand, and we feel pretty confident. We just know this industry. You know, we we can bet on those numbers to go in, and uh, we can build a facility and you know absorb that uh, excess demand for self storage. Now, in, in the case of an old facility, as you mentioned, if there's something that you know it just shouldn't have been built in the first place, maybe. But it, that's pretty rare because you, even a small facility, you can you, you phase these things in. You know, you, you build. You got four acres. You could put 400 units on it, but we're going to put one building up with 100 first and fill that up and then we'll bring the construction crew back and build the next and the next and the next. So the only times when somebody maybe get in trouble because it should have been built in, this, in the first place is if maybe they just flat out built too much um, or they didn't keep up with competition and you know they were the mom and pop that didn't add any technology and they hadn't raised rates and they, and they pulled every dime out of the property now it looks horrible and they don't have any money to reinvest back in it and then the other competitors came in and just ate their lunch because they have a better product and they have a website and they have the marketing and you know everything else to really just you know out, out manage them and out market them uh, but it's it's pretty rare that we go in and see that the market is actually broken in this facility just no matter what we do it won't work that that's pretty rare yeah. In terms of like looking at 
uh, you know, taking that three mile uh, radius around the property. Mm -hmm. Does it matter at all, like what the occupancy rate of the other existing mm -hmm. storage facilities is? And does like the income and demographics matter at all? Like if of it's course. a high income area or low income? All of the above, uh, absolutely. So when we go into that market, part of that market analysis is, um, you know, looking at uh, first, let's, let's look at the supply index that I just mentioned. That's the square footage uh, per person. That's called the supply index. So that's, that's number one. Then we go visit the competition to see what their occupancy is. Uh, because e even if it is a, a market that may, you know, is above that six and a half to seven square foot per person, it may be 10 square foot per person. Well, there's more demand in, in, in some areas because there's more apartments and fewer basements and high density housing um, and maybe a transitional area. Um, Florida has no basements. I mean, there's a higher demand um, factors at play in those markets anyway. So we visit the competition and if they're all full, and um, even if they, you know, they're supposed to create sense of urgency anyway, say, well, it's the last one. Do you want it? But when we go into the facilities and they say, well, we're full, you know, they're not lying to get you to rent something because they're full. <laughs> so we, we do that. Or we'll, if we can't determine what that is, we'll rent the cheapest unit and shh, and then go walk around and count the locks and find out exactly, you know, how many units are rented. So we can find out what the occupancy is at those levels. Uh, they publish their rates so we can see if they're if they're raising rates, you know, and if they're in line with uh, the market or the uh, the country. If the, and the, the rates are low, we know there's a, a problem with the market at, from that standpoint as well. So yeah, we go in and uh, what, what was the third part of your question? That uh, there was another piece I wanted to touch on. We talked about rates, competition, and and uh, oh, well, just occupancy in general. Yeah, I mean, if if, if we're going in and we see that the occupancy is low. Um, then, you know, we're, we'll look at, at the at the market again, look at the numbers. Are they just not marketing well? And, and if that's the case, if, it, if there really is an oversupplied and the rates are low, um, you know, all, all the competitors are at 60% occupancy and this facility that you're looking to buy is at 50. Well, if you think you're going to take it to 90 and that's going to be your value add, well, guess what? You know, that the market is already at equilibrium. You don't have much room to go up. And so in that case, you know, if you're banking it based on that, you know, we may back off. Again, that's very rare, uh, but those, you know, the facility may look great and your numbers compared to the price, that's the asset. But man, if you're going to drive value in this thing, the market is so important in self-storage and an income producing asset because we have to look at all those factors and where we can take it because we're always looking at exit strategy. So you're, you're spot on. We, we need to look at all those things. Yeah. Yeah. And I know we'll probably cover this later on, but just make sure I don't forget the question. When mm -hmm. you talk about uh, uh, advertising, when mm -hmm. you know, say an existing owner is not doing any of that, mm -hmm. like where exactly are you advertising? Is this yeah. like, like well, Craigslist or Facebook or yeah. Yellow Pages or what do you do? Mm -hmm. So uh, we'll walk into the facility and we're talking with these owners, especially um, you know, if it's a distress and it's not working well in the mom and pops. You know, one of the questions I'll ask when we get to that place is, you know, so t tell me about your marketing program right now. What, what's your marketing budget look like? And they'll say, well, we sponsor the Little League team and, you know, there's a, a diner downtown and, and we're in the top right corner of that placemat, that paper placemat that they put on there. We got the best corner up there. It's in the top right. That's where everybody looks. And we got our sign out front, you know, and it's faded and it looks horrible and there's, you know, it doesn't look like the place is even open and say, okay, so you tell me a little bit about where you're advertising, but, you know, tell me what your marketing plan is. And, you know, I, I you know, I get one of these deer in the headlight, you know, like I got a foot coming out of the my forehead and um, because they have no clue what a marketing plan is, you know, in terms of driving revenue or driving occupancy, you, you typically can't do both at the same time, but what, what are you doing from an advertising standpoint to light your, your facility up to make sure that people can find you? Uh, by the way, 90% uh, of all rentals are coming through on this these days. 90% of all rentals are coming through on this. It's a commodity. When people are searching for storage, they pick up their phone and they look to see who is closest to them. They get on that website and then they look at rates and look at pictures to see if it's clean. And, and then obviously the map, you know, and then they go and we can rent units using that device or reserve units using that device. And so the mom and pops that aren't even doing that, then yeah, they're falling way behind. So drive by traffic still important, but mostly for just awareness, top of mind, so that when somebody is looking to say, oh, I remember that now. And I remember the signs and the flags. I remember where it's located because I've seen it. So you know, we do put the flags out. We do have great signs. You know, we, we put antique moving trucks. We're, we're buying up antique moving trucks and doing kind of a partial restoration and parking them out front to draw people's eyeballs to them. Uh, but you got to be where people are looking at, you know, when people need storage, it's a commodity. When they need it, they're going to Google it. 
and we need to be able to, to be found. So, you know, the, the marketing side of this business has changed a lot. I mean, it used to be Yelp pages and thank God we don't have to do that anymore because they were so expensive. And, you know, how many, you know, AA, AA, all American, all access. <laughs> oh, yeah. Listening can you see because they all want to be at the top. Um, you know, that, that's not what drives us any longer. So um, it is marketing. It is uh, online where most of it comes from. A little bit of social media, a little bit of Facebook, but, you know, people aren't really getting to that place. And again, ads don't do a whole lot. It's not like, uh, you know, like a Val pack or some of the coupons you see on Facebook or anything else where you grab it, you know, you'll need to, you know, go to the dry cleaners or get your hair cut eventually for storage, it's, it's needs based as a commodity. So we just need to be there, answer the phone, you know, make sure that there's a website up and a presence there um, with call centers so that when they do call, uh, we answer. Uh, otherwise they're gonna go down the road. They're gonna go somewhere else because they, you know, they don't care. They just want somebody to answer the phone and mom wants to check this thing off her list, you know, rent a storage unit to put all of dad's stuff in. Mm-hmm. So, so I wanna dive in to kind of from a 30,000 foot view, like, mm-hmm. When you're approaching a market, I I lived in Indiana, right? I lived Mm -hmm. in Indianapolis and now I live in Chicago. Mm -hmm. Chicago has a ton of storage units. Um, You know, is it, is Chicago a good market? Are there pros and cons to a Chicago versus Indianapolis? Would you not even invest in Indianapolis? Would you, I have another friend of mine. um, He actually sent me some questions to ask you who lives in Anderson Mm -hmm. and he's in contract right now. Um, trying to convert a warehouse, a commercial warehouse to a storage unit in Anderson. Mm-hmm. Would you mm-hmm. target markets like that? Um, mm-hmm. Anderson, for those of you who might not know in terms of um, putting your mind, it's like there's like a small Christian college there, but there's really no super robust economic force. It's more kind of a rural small town outside of Indianapolis. Mm-hmm. So are you thinking, you know, big city, San Francisco, Chicago is good. Mm-hmm. Indianapolis, which is kind of a midpoint city or like mm-hmm. rural that has a, a, a chance of appreciation. Like what are you looking at in terms mm-hmm. of market? And then how do you find a deal in all of that? Mm-hmm. So our, our good, very good question uh, to uh, you, Jaron, and then also the person who asked it is, um, you know, we, we, we're investing outside of the major metropolitan statistical areas. And so we'll, we'll take in Indianapolis, which um, I mean, just to clarify, it's, is it like it's like the 11th largest city in the country um chicago is a what third or something like that um so you know i'm not investing in indianapolis i'm not investing in chicago but i'm investing in the donut cities the suburbs the donut counties around that so the second tier cities secondary cities um for people that are familiar with that it's basically once you cross the line and get out of that major msa we're we're investing within two hours of the major msas and that's about as far as we'll go um, we don't like rural areas or third tier because there's just not enough population. There's not enough going on or, or population increase to, to make sense, to create value. Um, so when you're talking about a market specifically, if I'm going to say, well, I'm going to invest in this market or this geography, um, Chicago doesn't show up, <laughs> put it this way, Cook County doesn't show up on the radar for any investor's map these days. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. I know why. <laughs> Um, the tax structure that there, there just seems to, you know, uh, there seems to be no ceiling uh, for those folks in, in terms of, uh, you know, the percentage that they can raise taxes. And so um, nobody's, well, n- nobody I know is investing in, in Cook County right now. Yeah. Um, but there's a whole lot of people coming right across the line and, uh, you know, Crown Point, Maryville, you know, Indiana, and uh, then also up into, into Wisconsin. Uh, so uh, again, I'm not looking at a market so much. I mean, I would tell anybody out there that's looking to get ready to do this, you, you start looking in your backyards and still draw, you know, two hour radius around your house. Um, there isn't a, a, you know, a self storage Oz where everything is paid with gold and the rates are high and, you know, occupancy is low and you can go in and create value and develop wherever you want. You, you start looking around because remember, I mean, even a Indianapolis or even an Anderson, Indiana, um, if you begin looking at a, at, a, at a warehouse to convert or a build a facility to buy, I'm going to then draw that still that three mile ring around that site in that facility. That's my market. So I don't mm. care if that, that market is in Anderson, Indiana or downtown Indianapolis or downtown Chicago or Miami or Beloit, Wisconsin. It doesn't matter. I'm, I want to know what's going on in that three mile radius around this facility that I found that looks to be undervalued or this site or this warehouse that I can get for pennies on the dollar and convert it and still end up with the less cost in that than I would if I built it from the ground up. So does that make sense? Yeah, no, that makes perfect sense. And that, that really helps clarify some things. How do you find these deals? Like, are you doing direct mail? Are, is there a, are these properties on LoopNet? Or is there like an MLS uh, 
alternative that's you know heavy in the storage unit world that's a tough secret i can't tell you that <laughs> all right so no different than any other form of real estate it's a shotgun approach so uh, yeah, there's self-storage specific websites. There's a, a number of them. There's about probably six or seven of them that we that we scour on a regular basis. And uh, they, you know, selfstorages.com and uh, list self-storage. You know, there's a number. If you Google self-storage for sale, you'll see those top ones. Uh, LoopNet is also one. Uh, we don't find a whole lot on LoopNet, um, even with a subscription service, uh, but put the keyword storage in there. Um, that way you find a lot of things. Um, and uh, because not just self-storage, because people listed as mini storage and other things. Uh, but what, what LoopNet is helpful for, Jaron, is um, mostly looking for the industrial pieces of property that, that could be converted and sometimes land. Um, so it's already got the zoning in place, so it's much quicker to convert something like that. So that's that's the bigger benefit of that. Uh, it's making relationships with the, the self-storage brokers out there in the marketplace. Uh, Marcus and Millichap, um, Argus, Sperry Van Ness, um, some of the, 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 the self-storage uh, brokers that are specific to that industry, but even the larger commercial houses and even the smaller ones, depending upon what city you're in, you, know, you find uh, the commercial brokers that, that do storage in that market and, and create a relationship with them. And you know, for us and for people that are starting out, you know, we're still looking for the smaller facilities, the Class C facilities that um, not everybody is looking for and has a perhaps a smaller buyer's pool. Can, so you, I tell can you, real real quick, I just want to dive yeah. into there. Hold your point because I want you to keep going. Yeah. But mm -hmm. in terms, when you define a small uh, yeah. storage unit facility, how many units are we talking? Yeah. So we, we've got classes. Class A, Class B, and Class C, essentially, in the industry. And so Class A, or, you know, it's it, it's a three-story gleaming next to Walmart or across from McDonald's in the downtown metro area. Most of what you're seeing in downtown Chicago, those are, even if it's one of those old industrial buildings, it's six stories tall that's been converted that's still considered a Class A facility, all temperature controlled, run by uh, the REITs, the professional folks. So public storage, extra space, you store it. So that's Class A. Um, Class A is, is the type, style of facility, how it's run and managed, but also determine the market that, that it's uh, located in. So a Class B facility, typically single story, very nice paved gravel in the outskirts, you know, still could be in downtown Indianapolis, but mostly in the, you know, the sandbox that we say that we operate in as well, um, just outside of the major metro areas, has a management company associated with it, manager on site, you know, 200 uh, units and, and above or so. Um, the class A, by the way, are usually um, 60,000 square foot and, uh, and above, or about 400, 450 units and, and above. Uh, then we get into class C, smaller facilities and class C. Uh, that means not only um, rural, uh, because there's just not a whole lot going on and the big guys aren't going to go out there as well. It's going to be single story and it's going to be older generation, first and second generation built in the 70s, 80s, maybe early 90s. Um, anywhere from, you know, maybe 25, 30 units. I mean, that's really small. That's not even a facility. That's just storage buildings. Uh, but then on up to about 200, maybe even 250 units. Uh, but deferred maintenance, uh, mom and pop, maybe absent mom and pop, no security systems, no technology, uh, somebody that's not in the office on a regular basis, very, you know, not very well kept. That's class C. So class C is small and rural and unkept. B is larger, more professionally managed, closer to the major cities, single story, some temperature control, some not, still has security systems, gravel and paved lots, and then A are the, you know, the multi-story real life facilities. So um, I'm contacting those commercial brokers and saying, hey, I want your junk. I'm a value add guy. Um, so I, I want the class C as long as it's in more of a closer to a second tier city, something that I could potentially take up to a B. I want something that's 150 units or more. I'd like, uh, I'll take something smaller, but it needs to be on three or four acres so that, you know, when the demand creeps up or if there's demand in the area, I can add additional buildings to it. So I, I, I want a, I want a 2X, I want a 3X my investment over the course of, a, a, you know, two or three years. And so those are the types of things I'm looking for. And so, you know, the brokers are competing with us. We're sending mailers out. They're sending mailers out, um, blanketing the area. I'm saying, don't go to the brokers. I'll give you more. And they're saying, you know, don't do this on your own. I'll get you more than anybody else. Uh, but then they're going to get those small facilities that, you know, are hard to finance because they've got, you know, mom and pop got their books and records in the back of their truck and in unit number 104 and, you know, all over the place. They can't put together a loan. Um, it's distressed. They've taken money out of the business and it's tough to get financed. And so that, that broker or their buyer's list that needs to make transactions quick and close quickly, 
you know, that that's not going to work for that broker and, and they don't have a buyer for those types of facilities. So I, I, I raise my hand and say, I want your junk, give me your junk, you know, to send it to me when you get those calls back from the mom and pops and you're going, you know, you're, you're freaking out because now you committed to them on your postcard that you were going to list it, <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. send it to me and uh, give me 24 hours with all the information you got. I'll go take a look at it and get back with you. If I'm going to make an offer, I'll, I'll, I'll let you know what that is. Uh, and if not, then obviously you you know, go on and I'll, I'll hopefully buy one for me eventually. But it saves them all that time and hassle of trying to figure out how they're going to get this finance with their buyer's list, um, you know, if they're going to sell it and then putting together a package, which would be almost impossible for them to do because they have no numbers to go on and then waste all that time and money to split, you know, a couple hundred to half a million dollars with another broker and then the house. It's not, it's just not worth most of these commercial brokers' time. So I, I'm providing a solution for them that we approach them by saying, hey, this is your lucky day. <laughs> I, I'm one of your new buyers for all your junk, you know, when you send those mailers out. So call me first. I'm curious when you're uh, sending out these mailers, like mm-hmm. what kind of people are you mailing to? Like, do you find everybody who owns like stuff that's zoned for warehouse or something like that? Or like, what, what does that process look like? Yeah, we start with existing facilities first, Seth. And so, you know, we, we got the SIC codes um, for strictly storage. Um, there's a list um, broker that we buy from, and uh, we just continue to buy from them over and over again. And we get a deep discount for doing so. And so we'll say, I want this zip code and I want all of these SIC codes, which kind of weeds out you know, some of the things that we don't want, like self-storage and convenience store or something along those, or a moving and storage business. I don't want that. Um, and then the, the people that we you know, get the list from, we send out a, a letter, like it's a you know, hand-stamped, hand-addressed, looks like a letter from mom. Mm-hmm. And then obviously follow up on all those because that's that's where the fortune is, is in the follow-up and, and, and following up with uh, every mailer that goes out and saying, hey, did you get my mailer? Interested yeah. in selling, da 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 da, da um, and go on down that path with them. Sometimes they'll call back, sometimes uh, they don't. Um, but then also you know, the second piece of that is then, yeah, we will go out uh, to, to the warehousing folks and just change that, that letter. Um, it's just a basic, you know, three paragraph letter. Hey, is it time to sell your warehouse? If so, then give me a call when you when you are, and I'll send you some money versus a broker. And I'm an mm-hmm. investor like you and. Some folks um, you know, would rather do that than save commissions and fees. That's appealing to them. Other folks are just, you know, they would never sell anything unless they did it, you know, through a broker. But we'll hit both angles. We make the relationship with the brokers and we're sending the mailers out, you know, somewhat competing with them in the marketplace. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. That's cool. awesome. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So I'm just curious, like, how do you fund this stuff? Because I know that coming from more the residential world of, you know, mm-hmm. working in wholesaling, mm-hmm. like, you know, especially in Indiana, like people are buying properties, you know, their marketing budget might, their all in budget might be like 50 grand, 70 grand, Mm -hmm. right? With storage Mm -hmm. units is a a lot bigger number. So Mm -hmm. how do you, you know, one from the acquisition side, but Mm -hmm. really where my, I'm curious is how do you get funding for extensions and and add-ons and value adds? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sure. So, um, you know, many of our investors that are um, and student partners that are getting into these deals also only have fifty thousand dollars into them. Uh, so let, let, let's take a step back. So, uh, if you're looking at a traditional, uh, I guess if you want to call it a traditional model, or somebody's got, you know, they they want to find a self storage facility, they're going to buy one as an investment as a hedge to the stock market. They don't want to put their money up there anymore. So they'll, they'll take whatever cash they have or a self-directed IRA, you know, any retirement dollars, and they find a million dollar property, they're going to get a 75% LTV loan and they got to put $250,000 down. So lots of commas and zeros, like you mentioned. So then they're, they're done, one and done after, after that, if they even have the ability to do that. And then either you know, live off that cash flow eventually, or you know, increase the value and sell it. Um, but that's not most people. Well, most of the rest of us, um, yeah, if people are bridging that gap, getting into commercial real estate. There are more commas and zeros. It means more of a down payment and more equity that you have to have to be able to play with. So, uh, first of all, it, it's not as difficult as people think in terms of the financing itself, because banks um, are lending more on the strength of the property than they are on the strength of you as a borrower. In other words, they're thinking exit strategy as well. Um, Jaron, uh, this property goes south. Jaron doesn't make payments on this thing. We exit Jaron, and then we get this facility back. Uh, well, good. Let's let's make sure that you know this is a solid facility. And because if we put a property management company in place, lease it up, and then sell it off, so they're they're concerned more with the asset than they are with you. So they go through the standard stuff, you know, and underwrite you and personal guarantees, and they'll get get some of their money back from you, but they want the facility. Um, but then when it comes to the down payment on these, you know, we're, we're layering equity partners on top of this. We're going out to the private equity folks. And I'm not talking about hard money. I mean, private equity partners where we give up a percentage of the deal 
um, they are passive investors and the returns that they get in our deals um, are higher than the, what they would see in the stock market and it's safer. They can see it, touch it, feel it. They know the industry is recession proof and inflation proof. And so, yeah, we, we don't have a whole lot of uh, issue in uh, raising the down payment over the equity portion of our deals because we have equity partners that are coming in that are, um, they're, they're not throwing money at this industry, but darn close to it right now. I mean, it's, it's one of the better bets out there. Um, and, you know, we, who knows we're 12, 18, whatever, 24 months uh, into the next correction or recession. And, um, you know, people are pulling cash off the table now. And, um, you know, we're going to have a heyday at that point because uh, we, we are the best game in town and we will continue to move on without a beat because we'll have a whole bunch of private equity investors. Um, we're, we're building the war chest right now. We got a lot of folks that are investing in our current deals and want more. And they'll be around and even more of them uh, come time for the recession. And uh, we will we will absolutely we're just going to kick butt. Uh, during that. We, it'll be our Super Bowl. We're looking forward to it. So. Uh, private equity is, a, a, again, the, the, the long answer to your question is how we're able to do this, continue to do more and more and more. And you know, most of them have a twenty-five dollars to $50,000 minimum investment. And hmm. so that's what I, as the syndicator, the promoter, you know, I'm matching that. So whatever that minimum is, I'm matching. That's my skin in the game. And um, so on a million, $5 million, $25 million you know, deal, if I'm still $25,000 uh, or 50000 in, that allows me to continue to double down and do more and more and more. So... So let's dive into that a little bit more in, in terms of detail. Um, what are we looking at in terms of like, how do you find these, you know, private equity investors? How, you know, obviously you can't go around saying, I guarantee you're going to make X return, right? That's illegal. <laughs> That's illegal, right? So how do you, you know, what's the approach? Like, how do you even start that conversation? What does it look like to put a syndication together? Kind of dive yeah. into to what that looks like. And, what are, and then from there, let's talk about what are typical returns? Like, what are these investors looking at? And what are you looking at as, sure. as a ROI? So, you know, in, in the beginning, it's, um, it's, it, it truly is networking. Uh, they call it friends and family money because that's what it is. In the beginning, it's friends and family. You're putting together um, a deal. Um, you're going to put together a private placement. It's going to be a private equity type deal, and they're investing in this. You know, you, you set this up. It's a, it's a 506B, Regulation D, 506B is registered with the Securities and Exchange Commission. It's, it's an SEC um, private placement. So these folks are investing in shares of that deal. So every deal, I mean, there's a hundred ways from Sunday of doing any type of deal out there. So including a self-storage private placement. So once we look at the numbers, um, let's say it's a conversion, we're buying a warehouse, we're going to convert it to self-storage. Um, here's what's going to cost for the building. Here's what's going to cost to fix the roof and the HVAC and build out the office, the shell, paint it and put a lobby in. Then we add on to that the conversion cost of putting in the self-storage doors and, um, and walls. Um, on top of that, security systems and you know kiosk and anything else. Here's our total cost. Uh, now, um, via our feasibility study, we have a consultant work with us. They, they state that um, it's going to take us three and a half years to. Uh, it's going to take two years to cash flow, and it's going to be stabilized in four years. We're going to be at 85% occupancy in four years. And at that time, given the market rates where they are right now, and giving a modest you know three percent increase in four years from now at 85 percent occupancy here's what the net operating income should be and then at that point the market um we say should be we'd be able to sell it at a eight percent capitalization rate or cap rate here's the value so now we take that you know projected value work that all the way backwards and say if an investor puts in fifty thousand dollars you know, they get cash flow after year two, and then they get the big windfall when we sell it out here at year four. Here's their pot of money divided by four years, gives them their internal rate of return, how much they made on that money over four years. And so it's, there's a time frame associated with uh, in calculating internal rate of return or IRR. And so that's how we attract folks. And uh, the, the way we attract them is by offering a higher IRR than say a Realty Mobile or CrowdStreet, Fundrise, you know, any of those other uh, platforms that are raising capital um, for people to just invest small amounts in. So we, we offer a little bit higher um, and that's how we raise money and, and collect a lot of folks. And then they tell other folks as well. And, and it grows from there. So now one more piece to add to that. Well, how, you know, we got this number out here. We're trying to get to an IRR. You know, what does that mean? You know, how, how much does Jaren get versus, you know, how much do we give to the equity investors? So it could be uh, Jaren as the syndicated promoter gets 50% of the deal and your equity investors get 50% of the deal. And so maybe it's one person that strokes the check for the entire amount of the down payment, or 
you know, it's 15 people all putting in $50,000, you know, whatever that is, it's 50, 50 and they, they get paid first and then you get paid. Um, but we're always backing into that internal rate of return. And so maybe you have to give up um, another 20%. And so now you're only at 30% over and they get 70%, whatever it takes to get that internal rate of return that is say in the mid twenties or, you know, right above 20% internal rate of return. Um, you need to manage to that number to get enough people that are interested to invest in that deal. And so at that point, you know, if you know, you need to use private equity and you're at say 70, 30, and you're only getting 30, well, how much money are you going to make on this? You're putting in 50,000, how much money are you willing to split? Well, unless it's a big pot, it may not be worth your while, but if you're, if you're splitting $3 million, you're going to make a million and a half or well, no, I take that back at 30%. You're going to make, um, you know, a little bit less than that, but you only put 50 grand in and you were the driver behind it. Yeah. Probably no, worth awesome. your while. Yeah. Probably worth your while. hundred percent of nothing is nothing. So, um, once people start thinking about partnerships in that realm where you're, you're the syndicator promoter, you're the general partner and everybody else is silent and limited. They're just putting their money in and collecting checks and they don't have a say in the business. Um, you know, that, that's, those are for, for us have been the keys to the kingdom. And, and we, we do this very, very well. Our properties do extremely well. Our returns are very high. And, um, right now we have more money than we have deals to do. So the growth side for us right now is finding more, uh, more deals to, to partner up with that private equity. So it doesn't go away. Mm -hmm. So have you explored um, purchasing through land contract or through owner financing and all? Like if you're talking to these mom and pops, is that even really we an do. option? Does that spook mm -hmm. them out? We do. I, um, I still like to have, um, I like to have control of it. I mean, I, I'd rather do seller financing, you know, and I get the deed, I get the contract through the bank. I don't like to buy on land contract so much because they still, I don't like anything to, I don't want to put a dime in any property that I don't have control over. I want the yeah. deed to cross the table. And so, I, you know, I'm familiar with all the, the tactics and the creative ways and, you know, land contracts and deed and lieu, or not deed and lieu, but contract for deed and, you know, uh, all the, you know, double gainers with a half twist and uh, that stuff. But I, I, I don't, I, I think all of it's risky buying somebody else's LLC, um, you know, um, I know people do it and people make money at it. But um, first of all, I'm an educator and I can't, you know, in good faith, go out and tell anybody to go out and do that. You know, that's just all of that is too risky. And I certainly don't do it myself. It's not even one of those cases where, hey, do as I uh, say and not as I do, because I won't even do that. So, but you, but what about like owner financing specific? If all day long. Does trans all day long? Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because cool. the deed comes across the table through the bank. Yep. Absolutely. How do you start that conversation with the seller? Because they probably never heard of that. Early on, <laughs> early on and multiple times throughout the negotiations. Um, I mean, it starts with um, that the, uh, the last thing that we say uh, usually uh, on the first conversation is um, say, Oh, you know, you know, after they say how much they're asking for and say, Oh, and by the way, you know, most of these uh, the facilities that we buy and people that are in your position are, you know, offering either some or all of this uh, is uh, owner financing so that they can, you know, still get an income stream from the property and reduce their capital gains taxes. Um, it, it, have you thought about how much you wanted to, you know, uh, put out there or keep back as uh, owner financing? So, you know, something like that, some kind of assumptive approach, or have you, have you thought about that? Uh, no, I haven't. What does that look like? Wow. Well, most of the folks that are, that do this that are, you know, at your age or, you know, at, at this stage of their career to avoid capital gains taxes, you know, it allows you to, you know, reduce to that, um, you know, defer that uh, as well and still get an income stream from the property. And I'm just like a bank because you're acting as the bank. And uh, so if they say no, or if they say, well, let me check with my CPA, um, every single conversation up to, um, you know, closing, I'm asking them if they're interested in doing that and, and stressing the benefits to them. Uh, but in some cases, you know, health won't allow it. Um, 1031, you know, exchange, they need to, you know, take all that money into the next project. They're just cashing out and retiring. Um, so it just depends, but I will certainly bring that up and, and stress the benefits to them of why they should be doing it. No, that's awesome. Cool. Now, when you're doing your due diligence and your homework on these properties, like, mm -hmm. you know, running your numbers and, you know, just even the condition of the property, all that stuff, mm -hmm. like, what would you say mm -hmm. are, are the most important things to be looking at? And are there any particular things that stand out as like a big red flag when it doesn't look the way you want it to? Yeah. So there's, um, you know, the physical aspects of the property. Fortunately, we're talking about concrete or uh, metal buildings on concrete slabs and uh, it is self-storage. So, uh, which means that the owners, you know, uh, of the facilities, including ourselves, when we own it, we don't have a key. We don't get into all these units. And so, you know, we can't see in all of them when we're doing our due diligence, but um, you know, the flip side of that, again, the good news is, you know, when you open up the door, what you can see is a metal box on a concrete slab. 
Um, so there's not much that we're ever surprised with. Uh, we, we hire con uh, inspectors to come out that understand, you know, how the contractors have built these things and they know what, you know, a well-constructed facility looks like. Um, most of these roofs are steel roofs. Some of the older generation um, you know, buildings have shingles on it. So we have them take a look at that. But um, it, having installed the standing seam metal roof correctly, if not, that's an issue. Um, checking HVAC and the temperature controlled units. Um, so those are the main things that, you know, seeing that it drains properly, that they didn't just scrape a farm field flat and put these things on it so it doesn't drain at all when it rains. So, so those are some of the things uh, to, to keep an eye on. And then the age of HVAC and the gate software and things of, you know, the, the major capital expenses. Um, beyond that, then we're looking at the numbers. I mean, we're, we're buying an income stream. You know, yes, we hope that the, the asset itself is in good shape, but we have to account for that. Um, but I'm looking at all the leases. I'm looking at all of the utility bills, you know, by month, you know, I'm looking at every dime that comes into this facility and every dime that goes out of it. So I want to see their general ledger. I want to see their tax returns and all of this is included in the due diligence and part of the purchase agreement. And uh, it's just, you know, acceptable. That's just part of it. So they have to give us, you know, um, all of their financials on this facility so we can audit it and determine, you know, Hey, what you told the broker, or what you have here is your net operating income. Well, you got those numbers from somewhere. So now I need to see the proof. So once we're under contract, yeah, those are all the things that I, uh, I need to see. Um, uh, one of the gotchas, um, you know, or the things to look out for, not even a gotcha, is, um, is the property tax. Um, if, if the last time it was assessed, it was assessed at $250,000 because it was vacant land. And the assessor in this uh, part of town or this part of the country never came back out after they built it. And now you're buying it for a million. Oh, man. Uh, well, you can expect there's going to be a bump in taxes depending on how they increase property taxes. But, you know, those are the things to look out for. Maybe one of the bigger um, items to look at is uh, are those property taxes going to go up? But then, yeah, during that, we're just going line item by line item, you know, questioning all the income figures and proof of it and all of the expense figures and proof of it. And then adding back anything that they've forgotten, mm -hmm. um, you know, they haven't accounted for repairs and maintenance because, oh, I did it or the manager does it, um, you know, lawn, uh, lawn care, snow removal. Uh, well, I did that or the manager did it. Well, Mr. Seller, unless you're going to do that for me when I buy it, you know, we have to apply, you know, an actual expense and industry average expense for those um, because it's going to cost money for us to have to handle these things. And so drilling down, we, you know, we stress what we call, we stress the net operating income. And so I'm not giving them credit for all their late fees for running the, the facility improperly. And I'm not going to give them credit for the expenses that aren't there. I'm adding all these back in that are real expenses. And I'm beating that NOI up so that when I come across the table with my purchase agreement uh, and offer that is considerably less than what they had listed, there's justification, a reason why, or I'm, I'm, I'm negotiating that purchase agreement if we're already under contract and say, this isn't what, you know, these are your numbers, you know, on the facility, it's not producing the NOI. Here's what the true NOI is. So we need to reduce the purchase agreement or the, the purchase price by this amount. And so mm -hmm. just you know, making sure that we've accounted for every dime and, and beating up that NOI and then um, then coming back to them with the appropriate price for their asset because they forgot a few things. Yeah. And in terms of, you know, figuring out an appropriate offer price, is there like some standard equation you run? Like take the NOI based on your calculations times something or I don't know. Yep, that's the cap rate that I alluded, uh, alluded to earlier. So in gotcha. commercial real estate, um, we take an NOI and, and, and the value is, um, it's a function of many things, the age of the property and other things, but um, essentially we're, we're getting our value from um, taking that NOI and then applying a market capitalization rate. So, and that also varies from class A to B to C. So class A facilities may be trading at a, at a 5%, 6% capitalization rate. It's a rate of return. Class B facilities, uh, you know, are going to be uh, up to, you know, seven, eight, maybe eight and a half percent. And then Class C, in order to get the, you know, uh, for people to buy those facilities, they're troubled and uh, out there a little ways, then you have to offer a higher rate of return or a higher cap rate. So eight and a half, nine, nine and a half percent cap rate. Uh, but we look across the landscape to see in that market, you know, what have all Class B facilities um, sold for in this market in the past six, eight, 10 months. Um, and if they're all selling between an eight and an eight and a half percent cap rate, then we'll take that NOI and put, put that cap rate on it or, or divide it by 0 0.08 or 0 0.085. And that'll give us a value uh, to say, you know, if uh, everything went to heck in a handbasket right now, we could turn around and sell it for this. You know, this is, this is what, it'll support a loan at this price and it's marketable at this price. And we can only go up from here unless something unforeseen happens. Yeah. Yeah. So it sounds like it's a fairly unemotional data-driven decision then. I mean, it, 
it has to be. And like it just is what it is. Yeah. It, is. it is what it is. And so we can get into the others. That's why um, there's an art, there's a science to the underwriting and valuation, uh, but there's also an art to it as well. And um, you know, how we, you know, you know, perform our due diligence and put our price on it when we take it back across the table to them. Uh, but also don't forget, you know, what the exit strategy is. Um, you know, we, we got to look to see where we could take it. Cause I'll still, I would still buy a class C facility at a 4% cap rate if it was only 20% occupied. Does that make sense? Yeah. Cause I'm only, I'm, okay. it's only banking on the income stream. And I know that when I take it up to, you know, if the market will support 85%, here's what the NOI is. And then I sell it at that point at a, even an eight and a half, nine percent cap rate. Uh, you know, that's going to, uh, the dollar amount is going to be huge. And so we don't hang our hat on that. That's the kind of the leveler, you know, all things being equal, and, you know, facilities at 80, 85% um, occupancy, this is the cap rate that we will apply to the NOI, but anything more that we create is going to be gravy. So we, you know, we, we do the underwriting again, we have two sets of numbers, you know, here it is now, are we, are we paying a fair price? Yes. Here's where we can take it. Well, I can even afford to pay a little lower cap rate or higher price because here's where I can take it because there's more upside on the deal. Yeah, yeah. I know. Like when I was in banking, something we ran into, uh, not a lot, but it definitely happened from time to time. Was, for example, whenever we would be uh, analyzing a restaurant, mm -hmm. uh, a lot of times mom and pop restaurants can be like, you know, they get paid a cash uh, mm -hmm. cash amount and they just cash kind of pocket business. it. And yeah. they just don't, they don't put it in their books. Mm -hmm. right. um, and I imagine that probably happens more often than not with very small mom and pop mm -hmm. storage facilities. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. when you encounter that kind of thing yeah. where there, there is like no historical data or just, it's not right. all there. Yeah. You just like make stuff up then, or do you just say, sorry, <laughs> I can't make an offer on this. Uh, it's, yeah. I mean, that's interesting. I mean, that, that creates an, op it's, a, it's frustrating and it also creates an opportunity for us um, because, you know, coming from the banking world, you know, I, I've got a set of numbers here from the broker, from the seller that they've given me as to what this thing produces. And then I'm going to ask them for their schedule E on their tax return for that property to see all the income and expenses. And guess what? That schedule E is going to look dramatically different than the numbers they give me. <laughs> the income sure. is lower and the expenses are higher. Mm -hmm. So I will use that and, and play that against them as well and say, well, you know, here's what I see on your tax return. And certainly you wouldn't lie in your tax return because that's but that's a tax fraud and you'll go to jail for that. So I'm, I'm sure these are the real numbers, correct? Sure. Oh, come on, Scott, you know, this is a cash business. So, well, you know, so what are you saying, Bill? Um, well, what I'm saying is when I sell lots of boxes of movie supplies, you know, uh, I'm putting six grand, you know, a year into my pocket, uh, you know, here, here, and here, or whatever, if they, if they actually come out and say that. Um, but if that's the case, I mean, even using round numbers of a 10% cap rate, if they put six grand in the pocket, you know, that's $60,000 in value that I can't account for um, on the NOI. And so therefore, you know, they just took a $60,000 hit on the value that they're gonna get at the closing table on that property. So, you know, having that discussion with them, they don't like it when you throw it back in their face and say, well, listen, you know, the appraiser, you know, since you did this, the appraiser can't see the income, the, the, the underwriters at the bank can't see the, this income. So therefore that value is not there. You know, mm -hmm. um, it's certainly not there for tax purposes, but you also, you know, congratulations, you just, you put six grand in your pocket, but you just shot yourself in the foot for 60 grand. Um, so that's, that's one challenge. But then the other is, yeah, if you can't get any data on these things, if there's no records, the proverbial shoe box is how they do their taxes and run their business, then we can piece it together. If this is a community bank that, you know, you know, given the, ins here's what the insurance is going to be. Here's what the property taxes are. And here's the income that we can see coming in right now. Here's our industry averages is how we're going to run it from expense standpoint. You know, yeah, we do. It's kind of a, a the NOI is, is it's Frankenstein. We've pieced it together from what we've got. And if the bank accepts it, um, then fine. Um, if we can show them the path of profitability and how we can uh, make this thing sing later on, then we're good. But if they got to hang their hat on a hard number and we can't get any banks that, that won't see what's going on, then it's, it's out. He's going to have to start putting the money uh, back in the till and then recording it for a year before he can sell that property again mm -hmm. or try to sell the property. Something I've been hearing, um, you know, kind of returns uh, like an eight cap. I've been, uh, you know, nine cap, 10 cap. I'm just curious, like in your experience coming from more residential buy and hold kind of a mm -hmm. background, you know, mm -hmm. people, I mean, I knew people who wouldn't buy a property unless they were making at least 15%, right? Yeah. Um, so in, in the, the storage unit world, I know that the average is eight to 10, but is that what your experience is? And is it okay? Because just the numbers are a lot bigger, so it's okay. Like, well, let's, we're talking about two different things here. So capitalization rate is, um, you know, the rate of return, if you just buy it and hold it, right? Right. 
um, that doesn't take into account depreciation and then also doesn't take into account if uh, um, I'm paying myself the management fee and I'm paying myself um, a property management fee as well. So the returns, you know, go up, you know, exponentially from that standpoint. But when you say a return, you know, um, if it's just a, a rental in, in the 15% range, yeah, maybe, uh, but look over the history of that. Not, not too many folks are doing very well when you take into account all the vacancies in over a three to five year period. Uh, but also in, in the residential world, most of that is um, realized on churning, churning properties over and over again. Well, if I take a property and like I said, I'm looking for a 2x or a 3x return. Um, if I turn around a property in, in two years, um, I, I bought it for 750 and I'm selling it for 1.5 or 1.2 million. Um, at that point, when I exit, that payday is huge and my returns are well north of 15% at that point. Yeah, no, that makes so sense. So I, I bought it at an eight cap and I improved it. And now it's running along at a nine cap, you know, in terms of just the cash on cash, you know, what's bringing it in. But, you know, when I sell it, ultimately my overall return, cash on cash or, or net return to me is, is going to be, you know, a 10x that number. So when you do your due diligence, is there like a certain number where you're like, if I can't make this in X years, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, I'm not touching this deal? Yeah. What's, yeah, what's essentially. And, and well, most of that is, is predicated now, Jaron, on the fact that I, I have private equity in these deals. And so if it's a deal that I'm doing on my own and I'm not sharing it and I'm not splitting equity, meaning I don't have to hit that IRR number, you know, um, then there's some deals that I'll look at that don't have as big of a margin or a big of a multiple on the back end. And I can afford to do that. And it still is worth my while. Um, so, but most of the deals that we're doing involve private equity. So, you know, these things, they need to be not, not doubles or triples. They need to be home runs and grand slam home runs. And so, um, it, it is all a function of, um, me looking out saying it's going to take three years to convert this and lease it up, or it's going to take five years to develop this and, and lease it and get it up to this place. And when I sell here's based on our projections, here's what the number is going to be. And, and roughly the IRR that, that is what is going to dictate whether I move forward or not. And if I have to give them. 90% um, of the, the cash flow and the profit on the back end, and I only get 10% in order to meet that IRR, then that's when I back out. Or I find a way to do it on my own and pull my cash flow somewhere, because then the deal may still really you know, work, um, but then I'm getting 100% of the benefit of that and using my own cash if, I, if it's okay. You know, if it's okay with me when I check with myself that I put that cash into the deal to see those returns. No, so if I'm understanding this right, so your ultimate goal with every sell storage deal is to basically buy it, turn it around, sell it a few years later. Like, do you ever buy and just hold it like, forever for the rest the of your life? Show? Yeah. Uh, I did that for about eight months back in 1993 following the Carlton Sheets method. <laughs> and I was going to hold on to everything. And, that, and since then, um, you know, if, if you look at, uh, I mean, I, I am not the most creative. I am not the smartest investor out there, but I, I get real estate math. Um, I understand it real well. And uh, when you buy something and create value, um, and then you, you sell it and you pull that money off the table and then you go buy two more or a, a bigger one and you ramp it up in value and then you ca recapitalize, you know, pull the, that cash out, recapitalize that. And you do that over and over again, you're going to be exponentially more wealthy than if you bought something, put your cash into it and built value and then just wrote it out with modest increase in rent, you know, modest increase in value or over time, the market, you put all that money to bed, all your equity is sitting there and your internal rate of return goes down. Um, you're just, you, you're, you're not losing money, but, um, you're certainly not as, you know, as long as I've got energy and the ability and a team around me, um, to go out and do this, I will always go out, buy, create value. As soon as I, I hit that peak, I'm exiting and pulling out and going into and doubling down into the next one. Um, that's how the wealthiest people in the world have made their fortune in real estate. Uh, there's a whole lot of wealthy people that are buy and hold, uh, but nowhere near as wealthy as the folks that know how to create value have gone out and done it. And then they do it over and over and over again and rinse and repeat. So eventually, when I get let me the, the the last part of that, Jaron, is that and stuff. When I when I get old enough that I don't want to do it anymore, I'll keep those last two or three or five facilities and then right into the sunset. But for now, I'm just building the empire. What does your work week look like? You know, in terms of hours, are you primarily just focusing on acquisition? Like, what it, what does that yeah. look like? Yeah. I don't, I understand the best business practices and I've got uh, third party property management companies that manage our facilities. We don't manage anything internally. I don't hire employees um, or staff those facilities. Those are all done by third party property management companies. We got three of them, uh, arguably four throughout the country, depending upon geography that we use and we hire them to manage those facilities and they oversee that. My job is to just meet with them regularly and, and make sure that you know we're, we're all driving the needle um, in the right direction. 
Uh, so I'm not working on that. And besides, I, uh, I can't stand managing anything. Uh, that's no fun. So for me, it's putting the deals together. So yeah, I'm in acquisition mode. I, I've got I've got two roles in my business, um, and that is to to raise the capital and to find the deals and match them up. So yeah. I, I'm doing these two things all the time. Um, obviously, there's other things that need to be done in the meetings with the management companies uh, on that side. But yeah, my my primary goal is to create the vision for the company, and then make sure that it is going up and to the right. And yeah. that happens if I mess up with management. How much hours do you put in per week? Is this like is this like a full time? You know, from the four hour work week mindset, right? <laughs> like, is storage and it's a. I mean, obviously, if you just bought it and you didn't care about being filthy rich and you just wanted to like you know, live on the cash flow, then it is a viable option. But for yeah. your method, like how many, how many hours of work are you putting in per week? Yeah, that's, that's hard to gauge. I, um, uh, I went to a strategic coach uh, a number of years ago, Dan Sullivan's uh, program um, to learn how to be an entrepreneur who isn't um, working 24, seven, 365. Because <laughs> uh, those of us uh, here on this call and many uh, other folks that are, I mean, we all know that, that it could get that way. You know, all of us are type A and we all could, could do that. Um, and I did that for a couple of years, but, you know, I also made a conscious uh, decision that um, you know, I, I want to raise my kids. And so our, our kids are homeschooled. Um, my wife works in the business with me as well as um, helps to teach uh, uh, the kids at, at the school that they go to. And we travel. Uh, I'm out on, we're on vacation or on the mission field for about six to seven weeks uh, out of the year. Um, and that awesome. doesn't include holidays and whatever else we do. So uh, when, I, when I'm working, um, I'm at my desk usually at seven and I shut it down at five and I'm there for my kids and I'm at every activity that I can be at unless I'm traveling for some, some reason. And um, I don't work on the weekends. So that's it. Uh, there's some weekends or some, you know, a season, maybe there's a week where we got to put a deal together and, and I have to work a little extra hard. But outside of that, I keep, I keep those boundaries. So, uh, but I, I'm, I'm in a little different place now, you know, the flywheel is spinning and I'm just adding to it versus the heavy lifting that needs to be done in the beginning. And so, you know, there's, there's no substitute for that in the beginning. You're going to have to put in the work. You have to put in the 60 hours a week to do so. Uh, but some of our folks, I mean, we've got doctors that, you know, sold their practices and didn't make enough to retire. And they came to our events and got some of our mentoring and we got them into a facility and they, they bought one and sold it for a million dollar profit, rolled it into the next one. And that provides now the supplement to their income, you know, to retire, you know, the way they wanted to when they first got into the medical practice. Um, it, it just depends, you know, what's your number, you know, can, are you fine with 20 grand a month? Can you live on that? Some people need 40 or want 40. Some people need 50 or some people want to, you know, just continue to grow and grow and grow and others want to buy it just a, as a, you know, a hedge to retirement for that one deal. And, you know, maybe end up with a, you know, 2 million bucks when it's all said and done. And then they sell that one facility off that they held for 15 years. So um, you, I, I mean, come on, we can all work a hundred hours a week if we wanted to. Um, but we can also reach our goals and be rich in life without having to do that. And it's not about the numbers and the money. Mm -hmm. I actually got a question. Um, about the management company aspect mm -hmm. of this. Yeah. So now that's just a, no matter what you do, whether you're planning to get in and get out or manage it long term, that's just a crucial component. Yep. So first of all, like what exactly is this management company doing? Like like what mm -hmm. is the day to day task? And then how much do they cost? And mm -hmm. then where do you find a good one? Or mm -hmm. how like what questions do you ask to know mm -hmm. that you're dealing with uh, an sure. agent? Sure. So there's, um, there's two, two components to the management uh, of this. And, you know, so there's a property management company and they oversee that asset. Um, so they're responsible for that, which means that they do the bookkeeping, they do the marketing for it and they staff it, which means that they do the hiring, they do the interviewing and the hiring of the person that is on payroll that sits behind the counter. So um, that is the property manager, but that has nothing to do with the property management uh, of the property or the asset itself. So there's, there's two functions. And so they basically handle all of that. Uh, their compensation, I will only work with property management companies that also have a performance uh, component to their compensation. So um, it's not a flat fee. They're going to manage this facility for two grand. And then, um, and then I pay on top of that the hourly rate for the person behind the counter. Um, that, you know, uh, clock watchers need not apply. That doesn't do me any good. I don't need a caretaker at the place. Um, the, our, our property management companies work for a base, a, a minimum amount per month, and then the rest is at risk. And so as the performance of the facility goes up, then so does their, their compensation. And it goes up by quite a bit um, because I don't make money. Our equity investors don't make money unless the property is. And so, um, yeah, if I had it my way, um, when I become supreme ruler of the universe, if anybody ever posts me, and uh, uh, I, all jobs will be performance-based and uh, there will be, you know, nobody 
you know, get, gets paid, you know, per hour just for showing up and sitting in a chair or standing. I love that. Yeah. So, I agree with that. Uh, so that's, that's, um, and so then the, the third part of stuff is where do we find them? Uh, you know, I, I, I speak at the industry trade shows and I'm there in the community, um, if you will. And so we interview and we know who's doing a good job. It's a, it's, uh, it's a, it's an extremely large community, yet a very small community when it comes to, you know, the folks are doing a good job uh, in the property management space. And uh, yeah, we know who they are. And those are the folks that we uh, that we use. And one of them, we've been able to really grow their company as a result of us expanding into different markets and we'll pull them in and then they'll hire regional managers and, and find a way to be able to service that market. And then they'll go out and try to find others on their own to manage as well. Yeah. Have you ever had to fire one? <clears throat> fire a management company? Yeah. Yep. And like, is there a particular reason why? Like what were they not doing well? What caused that? making me money. <laughs> um, yeah, it's, um, you know, it's, it's some basics just, um, you could tell you're never going to get a management company or a manager behind that counter. That's going to run it as well as you. They're never going to have that same sense of urgency, you know, in, in all facets, but you know, you come to expect that, um, you give up perfection and you, you, you can't expect them to any person or company to do that. But when they're, when they're not coming close to that, um, you know, to the point of, you know, just you know, really neglecting things and I'm having these same conversations and, and maybe some of the basics aren't getting done, then it's time to move along. Mm -hmm. Yeah, some of them, one of them just grew too fast and um, and that they didn't have enough regional supervisors to keep on top of the managers, therefore the properties. And, you know, we just, we weren't seeing that, that increase in performance that we knew that the property in the, in the market would um, dictate and warrant. And so it was just, uh, they weren't driving it because they didn't have enough manpower to do so. Mm -hmm. So that's about it. Sure. But again, if, you, if you've got that performance, you know, and, and it should be there, if you've got that performance, piece of their compensation in there. I mean, naturally that should drive them, uh, not in all cases, but at least, uh, at least helps. All right, Scott. So one final question for you is from my friend, Tyler. So he's the guy that I told you is uh, buying uh, an existing commercial pole barn and converting mm -hmm. it to a storage unit. He, mm -hmm. he just wants to, to ask like with the, the rise of uh, percentage rates w from, you know, the national prime level of like mm -hmm. what lenders will, will lend on, mm -hmm. if it continues to go up, if it goes up to where, you know, back in like the 80s where it was like 15% for you know, that you have to pay or 18% that you have to pay your bank for a loan, mm -hmm. what, do you, what is your take? Like, how does that affect the storage unit world? You know, because the, the ROIs are, are, are smaller. I guess like we kind of touched on this earlier. I guess the you know, it's a confusion between the cap rate and the ROI, but what's your, your take on, on, on that question? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you're right. You know, that, you know, the cap rate uh, goes in step with interest rates. So as interest rates rise, so does the cap rate. So you have to have a, a if the interest rate goes up a point, you know, technically cap rate should go up a point as well and be in step. Otherwise nobody would make, make money. You know, that's, that's the yield is the gap between the two. At the point if interest rates go up and cap rates stay the same, then all of a sudden, you know, you're just you're you're breaking even. You're not, you know, you don't have the returns, and uh, and it could get worse then eventually. So, um, the market and cap rates, you know, naturally kind of level off, and people just understand what an acceptable cap rate is um, to be if you're going to sell a property, and also the bank, you know, if it's a really low cap rate and interest rates are high, it won't cash flow and it won't have the debt service coverage ratio. So the market just takes care of that. Now, if it gets up to you know, 15 or 18 percent. Oh my gosh! You know, you'd have to be buying stuff. I mean, you know, people would have to come out of pocket to sell something, or would just be going back to the bank. So, um, I mean, I, I know what our answer is: is that we we obviously watch that some projects, development projects, won't work if it doesn't cash flow for two years, and then we start paying on that. Well, if it's accrued during that time, or if we're paying interest on interest at 18 percent or 15 percent, you know, most of these projects are dead before they come out of the water, and so there will be no development. Um, the existing facilities that are out there, people will just be holding onto them. They won't be able to sell it and they would have to get such a horrible low price because of that high cap rate. Because the more you drive your cap rate up, if you're selling, it means you have to lower the price of your property. Um, so by, by, by default, those folks are just holding on to it. But at some point, those folks that are holding on to those uh, facilities, um, they're going to have, uh, have to refinance and there will be a rate reset. And um, if they, they may have to come out of pocket if they didn't create enough value in it to cover the cost. And if that can't happen, if they're not coming to the closing table with cash and they're handing the keys over to the bank, banks aren't in the process or in the uh, business of holding on to real estate. So yeah, those of us that have the, the you know, the war chest of, of capital and cash that we had mentioned earlier, we'll, we'll take advantage and we'll be snatching those up um, if that's the case. So um, my, you know, 
after the last recession, my crystal ball is broken. Um, I, you know, I have no guesses as to when the next correction is going to occur. I got a, a sense for when that's going to happen only because I follow three folks pretty closely that, that, that have, are, I, I trust uh, quite a bit. Uh, but I also don't know uh, how deep it's going to be and what interest rates, uh, you know, will go up to. Um, I don't, you know, never say never again, never say always, but man, I can't imagine that we would get into that place where we're up in the 15 to 18% that would just shut everything down. But I'm fully prepared for things to go up to, um, you know, just shy of 10%. And, um, you know, and we're prepared for that. You know, the deals that we get into, I mean, nothing is, you know, uh, uh, is a total guarantee or, or with no risk. But we put ourselves in a position that we're we're projecting that you know five years. If this is a five year project, you know, here's where we think we're going to be in five years from now. And given rate increases, even interest rate increases, you know, how much have the Fed's really raised rates? You know, within that time, we look at worst case scenario, and is this thing still profitable if we sell it at that cap rate where interest rates are at that interest rate? Um, that's how we approach our investments at this point. So um, again, Tyler, I, I I can't tell you. Um, I can sit here and say, yeah, don't worry about it. Self-storage is great, <laughs> you know, five, seven years down the road and, you know, even if interest rates are 15%, uh, you know, you can refi or you can sell it because uh, I don't know, but um, uh, I'm not banking on that. And that doesn't affect uh, the way that we're investing right now. What does affect it is that we know the interest rates are going to go up by a certain percentage and we, 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 you know, we factor that into our exit strategy and the valuation afterwards. Uh, that's awesome. Thank yeah. you for that. I guess that kind of underscores the importance of, uh, you know, buying right in the first place. If for some reason everything goes horribly wrong and you can't sell it, like, it's okay because you still have a really nice cash flowing machine that'll last you for a while. But. Yeah, that old adage is um, your money is made uh, when you buy an investment um, all the time. You build your buffer in on the front end. Yeah, yeah for sure. Right. Well, Scott, I really appreciate your time. I know we're kind of, we're kind of going over our allotted time slot here, but... Before we wrap this up, if people want to learn more about you or connect with you uh, for any reason, what should they do? How can they get a hold of you? Yeah, probably the best case. I mean, if you're certainly interested in the, uh, the self-storage side, then uh, our website, selfstorageinvesting.com is uh, the best place to go for that. So we've got some free resources and tools and, you know, we, we do have live events. Um, they're exclusive events for folks that are you know, looking to step up and get into the commercial realm. And uh, learn about that side. We uh, we offer a, a class, a, a three day class, and these are these are classes. They're hands on. Um, they're two hundred one level on uh, how to find, evaluate, and purchase self storage facilities. We also have one on development, and then we also have one uh, on uh, how to raise private equity and, and syndicate and put these uh, together. And so, each of those are three days long, and we cover A to Z, the nuts and the bolts on uh, each uh, one of those facets of the business. So uh, yeah, go on over there and check that out, and pull down some of those videos and. We'll do whatever we can to, to support folks that are looking to get into this business because it's incredible. Yeah, it's hey, awesome. Jerry, we should uh, we should plan on going to one of those. That sounds like a lot of fun. Yeah, I mean, I, my guess, please do. Yeah, that's awesome. I, I yeah, so I, I'm I actually as you were talking, I just pulled it up on a new tab and I'm checking out mm -hmm. dates after we jump off here. So yeah, perfect. <laughs> yeah, I I normally am not interested in those kind of things, but I don't know this this subject and just. You know, given the things that you'd be covering in that sounds really applicable to yeah. what I'm interested in. So, And it yeah. sounds like the values there, Scott, I, that's something I do want to just give you a compliment on is mm -hmm. you seem to, um, to really like have no fluff. Just actually, I, I really appreciate your approach and how in depth that you've gone. Um, so, you know, thank you for what you do. Yeah. Oh, my pleasure. Our, our ultimate goal is, um, is to partner with people. And if we don't give them the tools and the resources and teach them, then, you know, we don't have a back end uh, to our business. And, and, you know, I wouldn't teach if we didn't have, if I weren't partnering with our folks. And so, yeah, um, you know, Seth, you said, I, I usually don't go to that stuff. Um, I know what you're talking about. There's lots of folks out there that are teaching that don't are actually doing it. And they aren't really teaching much at, at those events. Well, ours are 201 and we're giving people the content so that they can go out and find these deals and then bring us into them. And if we held anything back, it wouldn't do us any good. So uh, those two businesses feed each other. The, uh, the education side feeds our investment side. And so uh, they, they go in step with one another. So yeah, we're, we're showing you uh, what we do on a day in day out basis. Yeah, absolutely. That's awesome. Cool, man. Well, hey, for people who are listening, if you guys want to check out links to all the stuff we talked about in this conversation, links to all of Scott's stuff, uh, be sure to check out the blog at retipster.com forward slash 28. That's where you can find the show notes and the original video and audio clip for the interview and everything. So uh, thanks again, Scott. Appreciate it, man. My pleasure. All right. Hopefully thanks, we'll Jaren. Thanks, Seth. We'll do yeah. it. Take care. Okay. You bet. Thanks.